We had the most perfect Jeep for this video. I built this thing from the ground up. I bought it as just a bare rolling chassis, got a good engine for it, and put the body back together, all that kind of stuff. And when you really look inside one of these Jeeps, uh, when the air cleaner is out of the way, you can really see the wiring side of the Jeep. So there are three different things you need to run a Jeep engine. You've obviously got a battery, you've got a starter for the engine down here, and then you have the ignition coil. Let's forget about everything Jeep for a minute and let's just talk about the basics of wiring. Here are the three different types of batteries that you may find inside a vintage Willys Jeep. We're gonna start from left to right. Now in a Jeep, there are two different style electrical systems. From the factory, the Jeep was a six volt system and you'll find a lot of conversions and every modern day car is a 12 volt system. Now, how do you tell what kind of system you've got in the Jeep? If it still has a battery, this is really simple. If you look on top of the battery on the left, we've got three posts right here. And you basically double the number of posts, and that tells you what kind of battery it is. So this is obviously a 6-volt battery. Now, you can see a lot of crud around this battery. And this is a good signature that the battery is bad because it's just leaking acid out of the top. Now, you might be wondering, why would there be a battery with four posts on, that would be an eight volt battery. If there's only a six volt and a 12 volt, why would there be an eight volt? Well, the problem with six volt batteries is that they definitely work fine, but they just can't turn the engine over fast enough. If you listen to an old car cranking the starter motor, they just sound really slow compared to a 12 volt starter. So what people would do to kind of band-aid a bad electrical system is that they would go out and buy an eight volt battery. And these are totally safe to run in a six volt system. It just gives you a little bit extra juice to run that starter motor. So both of these batteries are commonly found on a six volt electrical system. Now you come over to a modern day 12 volt battery. You're not really gonna see the post on top of it. You'll know it's a 12 volt battery because how modern it looks. This one's got the two long oval tabs on it. Let's pretend your Jeep has no battery at all. You don't know what kind of electrical system you're working with. The key is to look at the ignition coil. You cannot read this coil because the bracketry is blocking all the lettering on the side, but let's look at some coils on the ground. Here are three different style ignition coils. Now, a coil will tell you if it is six or 12 volt right on the side. That one you can see it clearly says six volt, six volt, 12 volt. Now you'll notice this one doesn't have any writing on it. This one says no external resistor required. And this one says no external resistor required. Well, what the heck does that mean? Because a six volt system is, I mean, let's be honest, it's pretty weak. Um, people had a lot of problems with getting their engines to start because the starters crank so slow that it's hard to get the engine running for the first time. What they would do, rather than saying no external resistor required, it may say external resistor is required. Now this one says nothing on it, so I'm just gonna assume that this does need an external resistor, which I've got sitting right next to this coil. And the idea is, you see there's two different tabs on here. Now I personally do not work with these systems at all. They're a little outdated, not necessary, but I'm gonna post a wiring schematic in this video. The idea is that an external resistor, you've got your two different posts here. You have one post that runs the coil when the engine is running. However, the advantage to this is that when you're cranking the engine over, it basically bypasses the resistor and gives a lot more juice into the coil to make the spark, which is the fire in the engine, a lot brighter, a lot hotter than normal. That way it's so much easier to ignite the fuel in the engine and get that thing started. So once you let go of the starter, and then it goes back into the coil into regular voltage. So you get high juice when you're cranking the engine over, and it drops down to normal juice when the engine is running. Now these coils that say no external resistor, they don't use this system at all. Basically when you're cranking the engine over, it's the same amount of juice going into the coil as when it's running normally. Between your battery and your coil, you can pretty much figure out what style electrical system that you have. Now for the sake of this video, 
I'm gonna be working with 12 volt because everything I'm putting on the Jeep is 12 volt, so it's just gonna be a little bit easier for me. Now, the good thing is that on a Willys Jeep, it doesn't matter if it's six or 12 volt, they wire identically. It does not matter what style voltage you have. Everything I'm talking about in this video, you can do it to a six volt or 12 volt system. Generally speaking, in all modern vehicles and the Willys Jeep, the negative, which is a ground terminal, means ground. As in everywhere, the entire ground, people also call the ground terminal the earth. So the earth is just everywhere. And what I mean by that is, obviously it takes two wires to tango. You need a plus and a minus to make any electrical component actually work. So when a battery is sitting inside of a Jeep, you'll find that the negative terminal, the ground, is connected to anywhere on the Jeep. You will find that the negative terminal is bolted maybe to the top of the engine, or it's bolted to the body. You know, anywhere that is a main section of the Jeep is where you're gonna find the ground terminal. You know, pieces that kind of bolt together, they kind of scratch each other and make an electrical connection and that way you know that everything is just kind of grounded together. And when it comes to grounds, you want this terminal to touch everything on the Jeep. You want it touching the engine, you want it touching the body, and you want it touching the frame of the Jeep because you're gonna use all this stuff as contact points for all your individual electronics. This battery tray, which is welded directly to the frame of the Jeep, you'll find a lot of people will bolt the wiring terminal to the frame itself and then come up and connect it onto the negative terminal of the battery. And then you're like, okay, you know, the frame is grounded to the battery. How do we get the engine onto the same wiring connection? All Jeeps from the factory had ground wires. One end is bolted to the frame of the Jeep, which the battery is connected to. Then the other end would bolt directly to the engine. That way the engine is connected to the frame, frame is connected to the battery, and then you would add another one of these wires onto the body of the Jeep itself. You'll notice during that demonstration, I used a black wire to simulate the ground terminal. That's because worldwide, black is genuinely accepted as the color of a ground wire. Now as for the positive terminal on the battery, also known as the hot wire, it's very bright, it's the hot wire. Now the positive terminal of the battery only touches components when they're ready to operate. The ground they're touching all the time, and when you're ready to flip a switch, the positive is the one that touches it. Now let's hot wire something on these terminals so you can see exactly how they work. And of course I picked a tail light, and I don't know why, but headlights and tail lights are completely different from the rest of the world. Um, I don't know if it derives from house wiring, but on headlights and tail lights, for some reason, they make the ground wires white and then the hot wire can actually be black or red depending like black might be the low beam and red might be the high beam but if that confuses you just forget about the colors that I'm playing with right now we know that the ground is always connected to somewhere on the vehicle let's pretend that on a tail light we've got our ground wire connected to the frame right next to the light it's nutted and bolted so that's already connected now when we flip a taillight switch, that is going to activate the taillights. So we'll take our positive wire here. When a switch is activated to actually operate this light, it'll actually touch the positive terminal of the battery. And our light is working. It's as simple as that. It only takes two wires to make any electrical component work. Obviously, anytime we want to use an electrical component, we don't want to have to go up and walk to the battery and tap it on the terminal we want to just flip a switch on and off. So I'm going to show you a few different style switches that we've got right here. Now, there are two main style switches. There is a momentary and a non-momentary. So momentary, think of it as a moment. It's quick, snappy, doesn't last long. For example, this is the controller for my winch, and it's got built-in uh, switch on the inside of this. So a momentary, you push it down, and it pops back up. So if you want to use your winch, you want a momentary because you want to stop the moment that your hand lets off of it. And that works for both the in and the out. Now obviously a headlight, 
You don't want it momentary because you'd have to sit there and hold it the whole time. You want it to stick all the way down. So a non-momentary switch is one like these right here. So you flip it to the on position and it stays there until you flip it off. Now that's a one-way switch. Sometimes you can get a two-way switch like this one. There's an on position up there, off, and then another on position. So this switch would be good. Let's pretend you've got uh, high beams for your headlights up there, and then you go downwards, and that would be your low beams. So there's plenty of different ways to use these style switches. When wiring up these switches, it's actually very easy. You just got two different terminals, one here and one here. So for example, let's just pretend this light is literally anything. Obviously your ground wire goes to the earth. Don't even worry about that. All we need to worry about is the positive wire. So we'll put one end of the positive here, and then this end of the wire would go to the battery itself. The moment that you flip that switch, you run the current from the battery into the light and then you shut it off and it breaks the connection between the two and the light does not turn on. Now playing with these little switches for lights and miscellaneous parts, you're thinking, well how the heck do I make a starter work off a tiny switch like this? And the answer is you don't. You don't use a switch like this at all to turn your starter on and off. That is where a starter solenoid comes in. Now a solenoid is basically just a gigantic switch. I mean this thing, if you put it in your hand, it's absolutely massive. That's because it's meant to take pretty much all the power of your battery going through the switch to activate the starter. So how the heck do you wire a gigantic switch this big? There's four posts on it, doesn't make any sense. Now on a starter, the battery positive terminal comes out the top right here and the ground is pretty much everywhere else. Usually they'll ground themselves through the face of the starter right here up against the bell housing of the engine. So when you come to a starter solenoid, now it doesn't matter which side you start with. This side could be your battery positive wire connecting directly to it and then you can connect to this terminal to the starter positive wire. Or if you want to hang this thing the other way, battery positive can come here, starter terminal can go right there, doesn't really matter. So if they're both connected, how do you tell it when to operate the starter? That's when these center terminals come in handy right here. You'll find two different style starter solenoids. The first style is like this one, you got two posts sticking out of the center. Other times you're going to find one post out of the center. See the I is for ignition and the S is for start. The I for ignition is connecting it to the coil to give it that little bit extra juice when you're cranking the engine over. We're not gonna talk about that today. The S is the only thing that we care about. So the S goes to your key switch, and the key switch is what tells it when to power that starter. So all your starter needs to know is that battery positive's coming in here, and then the other end goes right to the starter. One interesting part about starter solenoids is that you have some juice where these are mounted externally on the fender, on the firewall, etc. However, there's a lot of Jeeps where people mounted the starter solenoids right on the starter itself, such as the starter right here. But the battery input is right here, and then the starter output is on the other side, of course, and there's a metal bracket that runs from the solenoid directly to the starter itself. Now unfortunately we don't get to work with nice shiny wires all the time. If you have all your wiring put on correctly, but the engine, you know, the starter's not cranking over, nine times out of ten, it's just nasty wiring. So let's look at this old solenoid right here. See how rusty everything is? I would guarantee if you took the nut off and you pulled this wire off, A, it's all open and exposed anyways, but uh, you'll find that these points of contact are just dirty. And if they don't have a good connection, then they just will not work very well. Here's a perfect example of that. This is a nice, good, clean contact of brass or copper. And if you look at the back side of it, that thing just looks dirty. So what I always do is just take these apart and then clean them. That way you're starting with a fresh point of contact. This is a standard key switch that I bought off Amazon. It has only four posts on the back side of it. 
going through all the posts right here, we have an ignition post right here, a battery post here, a starter post here, and an accessory drive post right here. We're going to ignore the accessory drive for right now. All we need is the ignition, the battery, and the starter. So essentially, on the battery positive, we're going to connect it to the battery here. On our 12 volt coil, we're going to connect it to the ignition. And then on the starter, we're going to connect this to the solenoid wire. This is exactly what your starter harness should look like. We'll start from the beginning, just kind of retrace everything once again. We've got the ground wire from the battery grounded to the frame of the Jeep. We've got the ground from the frame of the Jeep hooked up to the engine, right down there. Then we have the positive terminal of the battery going onto this on-off switch. Now, you're not going to have this on your Jeep. I only have this on here because the winch on the front end, just a little bit of safety. In case things go haywire, you can run up and just disconnect everything from the main battery without having to pull a terminal off. So just imagine this isn't here. You've got your power wire from the battery going down to the starter solenoid. We've got that on one side. This is my winch, you can ignore that wire. So we got the positive terminal of the battery going down to the starter solenoid. And then the other end of the starter solenoid is going straight to the starter itself. And then of course we need the wire to turn on the solenoid, which is our green wire that's going to the key switch. So you put that green starter wire on the start terminal of the key switch. And then the ignition side of the key switch goes directly to our coil. Of course, we need to give the key switch some power uh, to run everything. So the power wire of the key switch is directly connected to the positive side of the battery. And we've done that by right down here on the starter terminal. We've got it mounted on the same lug as a battery cable. Of course, you got to make sure the key switch wire is directly connected on the battery side of the solenoid. But of course, it will not work on this side because it would only get power when the starter is cranking. And the starter can't crank because the key's got no power. Now, hooking these coils up are really simple. Obviously, you've got the plus going to your key switch. And then the ground terminal directly connects to the distributor. You always want to make sure that this wire is in good shape, contacts are all clean, that kind of thing. Here we go. Now let's say you've got all your wiring hooked up, the starter's cranking over, but the engine will not fire. You verify the engine's got great compression on all four cylinders. You've got either starting fluid or you've got gas inside the carburetor, you know, pumped through the gas tank and it just will not run. Well, 99% of the time it's because you don't have any spark going to the spark plugs. What would cause the spark plugs to not get spark? A great way to verify if you actually have spark is if you have a spare spark plug or take one out of the engine, and connect it to the wire, but leave it outside of the engine, set it on top. A uh, spark plug really needs to be grounded to operate properly. So luckily, I've got these nuts that hold the head of the engine down, and they're uh, raw steel, there's no paint on them. So the spark plug will be grounded by touching that. And we can crank this over, and we're gonna look to see if there's any spark inside that plug. I turned the lights out so you can really pick it up on camera. We're gonna see the spark coming out of that plug. Now when you're looking at the spark on the spark plug, you're looking for a blue spark. Blue is a good, clean, hot spark. If you're seeing yellow, maybe you don't have the plug grounded very good on the engine, or you've got a little bit of a weaker electrical system. Um, you, blue is the best. You do not want, it'll run on yellow spark, but you really want to strive for that blue. Now if you do not have spark, there's a lot of easy ways to tell where things are going wrong. The first thing I do is I pop off the distributor cap. If you look closely, these are what we call the points of the engine. And as we crank the engine over, these are going to click up and down. And every time they click down, that's what makes the spark that goes into your spark plug. The number one problem that people have is if you leave a key switch turned on, you're actually giving this thing power through your key switch, right? So what happens is when people leave a key switch turned on, 
it keeps power going into this point system and you can see this has got a little bit of a gap open on it right now it just where the engine stops it might stop with these points open or might stop with them closed and if you leave the key switch on with the points closed you're giving that point of contact power and it basically burns up the points and by burning up I mean it just blackens out the contact points it could start a fire but not typically you're just going to burn out that point of contact and when that contact is burnt out it doesn't have a good enough arc to spark your spark plugs anymore so all you really need to do is just take some sandpaper and go in between those two and clean them out really good and most of the time that is the problem once you know the rules of the game you know how to break them I've got my key switch turned on and I've got a screwdriver in my hand and what I'm going to do is just artificially touch these two to see if they are sparking. So I'm just touching them right here. So see that? We got plenty of good spark down there. Okay, we're going to watch that point of contact right here as I crank the engine over with the key switch. See, it's a little bit harder to see that way, which is why I just kind of go with the screwdriver method. If you do have spark at the points of contact and those are really good and clean then you've got a problem after that section this little rotor that spins around you want to make sure that all these points of contact are clean as well as on the inside of the distributor cap you can see on the inside of the distributor cap as that rotor spins around it hits each of these points of contact and that tells each spark plug when to fire all of these need to be in good clean condition you can see this one looks basically brand new that's what you need and if all that looks good, you could have a bad uh, plug wires. You know, these things get old and corroded, or maybe the wiring is pulled out of the boot, or maybe you just got some bad spark plugs. Pretty easy to diagnose. Now, if you do not have spark at the points, then you have a problem before it. Oftentimes, you need to make sure your key switch wiring is good going to the coil, but you could have a faulty coil. Again, very, very common. And then on the inside of the distributor, you'll notice that it's got this little box right here. Now this is called a condenser. And this condenser, basically, it absorbs energy and then sends it all at once. That way you get a good hot spark. And these things typically go bad as well. Not nearly as common as much as a coil though. And of course, you wanna make sure that all your wiring is good, clean, nothing going wrong there. There's a lot of guys that you'll read about on the forums that are like, my Jeep runs good, then once it gets warm, it just loses all ignition. Nine times out of 10, bad condenser. I don't know why they quit working when they get warm, uh, when they're no good, but that's just how it happens. When they're cold, they'll work fine. Engine gets warm, things just kind of quit working. One thing you really want to be careful of is, see how that rotor just kind of slides off? Sometimes these are slotted, like this one's got a slot in it, and the rotor only goes on one way. But some people take these off, and they don't have the slot, and you can put them on four different directions. And if you put this thing on, let's just say backwards or sideways, you've just changed the timing of the engine because as this spins around, it makes contact with these spark plugs. If you put this thing on 90 degrees, it's hitting the wrong spark plug and the engine will just never run. It'll spit and fire and all that bad stuff. So always put that rotor back on exactly how it came off. It's not uncommon when you go to buy a Jeep, they're like, I try to get it running. It's just misfiring and it won't do this or that. It's very common people put the rotors on wrong or they'll pull the spark plug wires off the cap and they'll put them on in the wrong order. It's not hurt to check that they've got the wires put on the right way and we call this the firing order. If you don't know what your firing order is, luckily for you, Willie's put it right on top of the engine. It's right there, see, one, three, four, two. That means as the engine is running, you got the first one fires, then the third one, then the fourth one, then the second one. Simple as that. Take that firing order and then you apply it to your distributor. You put the spark plugs in the exact order and there's a really nice diagram to look at to see exactly what I'm talking about. I'm going to throw one more curveball at you because it happened to me one time and it's just so frustrating until we finally figured it out. I had a Jeep one time that it would run great and then it would start misfiring and then it wouldn't run at all. It's like someone was changing the timing. The main shaft right here is actually bent. 
So as this thing was spinning around, it was working its way out of the timing and it was so sloppy that it would shift up and down and side to side and it would just lose its timing location and the Jeep just would not run. So that Jeep had to get a whole new distributor put in. An easy way to tell if yours is bent or not is you pull off this rotor and just crank the engine over while watching the shaft and make sure that it doesn't have a lot of like side to side play. They might have a little bit of play like this one has just a tad, but that thing was jiggling all over the place and just not fixable. We are going to simulate what happens when you've got a good working solenoid and a bad starter. Now to simulate this, I've simply just taken the wire off my starter. That way you can hear when a solenoid is working, it'll click when you turn the key switch. That's how you know the solenoid is working. If you don't hear a click, then the solenoid is not working. Got our key switch here and we're gonna listen for the click of that solenoid. They're pretty loud, hard to miss. Once you've got your engine cranking, it's got good spark, everything is just working really nice. Let's talk a little bit about safety. Obviously, you're not gonna have this key switch with wires dangling all over the place. It's gonna be up underneath your dash. Now, heaven forbid, if something goes wrong electrically, it can and it will, something shorts out or a mouse maybe chewed on a wire and all of a sudden there's a shortage in the electrical system. The battery's not gonna care, it's gonna keep sending juice and oftentimes that will start an electrical fire or burn up components, it's just really bad and it smells awful. You have not smelled a bad smell till you smell the burnt wire, it lingers forever. So how do we fix that? Well, I'm sure you've heard of a fuse. Everybody's cars have them nowadays. Fuses are actually a really neat technology. This is a fuse block. This has four different slots for fuses. Not too big, but let's talk about what they do. Some fuses are see-through and you can see that little strand in the middle of them. It will not take 16 amps, it will only take 15. What you should do is put fuses in your electrical system. If you're not too keen on electronics and you don't know which fuse to pick, you can just look things up online. Look up how many amps an ignition coil will use. If you're running, let's just say a headlight, you know, headlights are gonna require a lot of power. That might take, you know, on an LED system, maybe 10, 15 amps. On non-LED, could take up to 30. You know, electric fans, all that kind of stuff. Everyone in the world uses fuses nowadays. Even our boys at Oxbeam, who were gracious enough to give us these lights, they gave us a wiring harness that's included with the lights. They make things easy because they just give you a positive and negative terminal to hook up on your battery and the rest is already done for you. Now if you'll notice here that there is a fuse. This is what we call an inline fuse. It's essentially one end of the battery goes into this fuse and then the other end goes to power your electrical accessory. And if you pop that cap open you're going to find the fuse sitting inside. This one looks like it's a 10 amp. Because um, again, LED lights, they don't draw a whole lot. But if the lights were to short out and they start drawing way more power than what they should be, this fuse is going to break internally and cut power off. And then you can figure out what the heck went wrong and why your fuse blew. Most of the time when a fuse blows, it's going to be kind of burnt up inside. And you'll look at the strand and it will be split apart. They almost always are pretty easy to tell by a visual eye. Now sometimes... You can't see inside the fuses, they're not made uh, transparent. In that case, you can just put in a different fuse if you can't quite tell. If you know you got a ton of electrical parts to put on the Jeep, and you don't want inline fuses all over the engine compartment through the chassis, you want it in one nice spot, that's when you buy a fuse block like this one. Now this only has four different positions in it, not a very big one at all. The upside of electrical parts is there are so many variations and things to pit from. But the downside is it's just hard to explain all in one video. Now this particular uh, fuse block, you'll see there's a big terminal sticking up and a piece of metal that goes underneath and then these screw holes. So what you would do is you take the main power wire from your key switch or your battery, you hook it here, and then it's automatically connected to all four fuses already. And then the part going to your accessory would mount to these little screws right here you have, let's just say this one goes to horn, this one goes to headlights, this one goes to a radio, whatever it is. If you see a fuse block that has screws on both sides and no lug right here at all, 
you've got to individually put every power wire going to every uh, fuse. Think of how much more wiring that would be. It's just kind of a pain. I like this setup a lot. The unfortunate truth is that safety makes wiring complicated. A lot of people brag about how simple original Jeep harnesses are. You just plug the wires in end to end, no problem at all. However, something goes wrong on the Jeep just one time, you could have an electrical fire that could burn up your Jeep. So when you start complicating things with fuse blocks, yeah, it's a little bit messier, it takes a little bit more time, but it is so worth the effort in the end. So I've mocked it up a little bit for you. Now, I don't mean to confuse you. I know this is not the most beautiful wiring schematic to look at. I use these three wire key switches. You'll notice that I took the coil wire that was gray. I took that off the key switch. And that wire is now going straight to the fuse block because if something goes wrong with that coil, I want a fuse there to stop it. I just threw that 15 amp fuse on here that came with it. Not the size I would use, that's way too big but it's just there for demonstration purposes. The best time to power up a fuse block is only when the key switch is turned on. So right now, the key switch is uh, in a neutral position. The key will slide right out. This block is not powered up until I click the switch into the run position. How do I get away with that? Well, there's not a fuse block terminal on this key switch. I use the ignition terminal off the key switch to power up the fuse block because you know when you turn the key switch to the on position that ignition is on for the car so we're just taking the ignition part and running the fuse block because anytime that the ignition needs to be on you want to be able to turn lights on and off now obviously you cannot put your starter on here because anytime the key switch is turned on you don't want the starter cranking over so you always have to leave the starter on the start terminal of the key switch but use the ignition side for powering up the fuse block. Now this is where a lot of people go wrong. They'll say, okay, I'm gonna run my headlights here, my light whips off of this, my radio off of this, and we'll be good to go because we have fuses. Well, you are severely overloading the one little wire that's powering up this fuse block. Now this wire, I go with a bigger size than let's say the ignition wire or the starter wire because it's supporting all these different fuses but you don't want tons of electrical draw going through one little wire that's going through your key switch. You need some safety. Going back to the wiring harness that came with our lights, that is where the relay comes in. We were talking about this inline fuse earlier. You may have noticed this giant. Why the heck would you want this big old relay in your wiring harness and what does it do? It's actually pretty ingenious. As I mentioned before, you don't want all the electrical strain of your entire Jeep harness going through that key switch to that little wire to the fuse block. And this is what gets rid of the major electrical load. So if you pull this thing out, you're gonna notice that it has some posts underneath it. And there's a few different styles of relays. They're not all exactly the same. They might wire a little bit differently. So I'm not gonna tell you exactly how to wire one. And notice how it only plugs in a certain way. That way you can't put this thing on the wrong direction. It only goes in one way. These things basically work identically to the starter solenoid, which you already know a lot about. You have the main power wire going into this and then out to your electrical accessory, just like the starter. You have your battery going in and it's already going out, touching the accessory that it's supposed to operate. However, you just need to activate and tell it when to give it the power, just like the starter solenoid. Let's pretend like these are your headlights. When you flip a switch on your dash, all you're doing is telling this to connect those two big wires. It takes very little electrical draw to operate a switch. I mean, it's pretty obvious on like the starter solenoid. You have big lugs on the side and tiny lugs on top. I mean, it, it just doesn't take a lot of electrical load to tell the switch when to go on and off. So that is the benefit of a relay. You'll notice on this accessory, it's got a long harness and this goes to your dash. This is the on off switch to operate that big old relay right there. Now when you're working with the relay system, you'll notice the fuse is between it and the battery terminals. That way if something goes wrong with the relay, it blows the fuse right on the battery side and it cuts power to everything. You don't need the fuse after the relay, before is just fine. Now, since this thing is integrated, the moment you hook that thing up to a battery, this key switch is gonna make it work on and off. There's no fuse block that you need to connect this switch to if it comes with the pre-made harness. 
Well, that's enough wiring talk for today. I hope this video was informative enough that someone that has no experience wiring anything could go out, buy a Jeep, drag it out of the woods, and at least have the electrical side to where you could wire it up and run the engine for the first time. Or if it's not running, be able to diagnose why the electrical components are not working the way that they should be. I really encourage everybody to go look up some other YouTube videos to go into more of the advanced side of wiring, different types of wiring connectors, weather pack wiring connectors, uh, modern split wire looming, cable management, all that good stuff. All those little details that take a build to the next level.